What's going on? What's up? I'm sorry. I took a little bit to unmute there. No, it's all good. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate it. For sure. For sure. So our podcast is about your journey in music and uh, how you got to where you are today. Cool. Sweet. I did read you're from, I, I read a little bit about your story. Uh, I saw you're from Pitzel, uh, Pennsylvania originally. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually in Le Moyne, PA right now, but I've been all over the place. I moved like 11 times in my life. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I started in uh, West Penn, Pennsylvania. It's like by Tamaqua, which is a little bit, it's close to Allentown. That's what I tell everybody because those towns are so small. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you, you said you moved around a lot. Were you there until like, how, how long did you live in Western Pennsylvania? Uh, so it was Northeast PA. Um, and I lived there till I went to college. I went to Philadelphia. So I moved there. That was my first start. And like, okay. um, you know, like a bigger place. It was the first place I got out of, you know, out of West Penn. Sure. Okay. Right on. And how did you get into music originally? So I basically was journaling a lot mm -hmm. about 13 years old or so. And then uh, I had an acoustic guitar and decided to just try to sing what some of my journals were. So it started with that and continued with making a cover band in high school. And that was more of, you know, just to get more known around town and start the music career per se. But uh, yeah, that's basically how I started doing it. And then I just continued doing it when I moved to Philly. So uh, you said you started with acoustic guitar. Was that the first instrument you learned? Did you know how to play the guitar prior to trying to mesh guitar in your, in your, uh, your lyrics? Um, <clears throat> I started with drums, actually. I was oh, okay. younger. Yeah, I actually just released a song called The Way I Am, and that's the lyric video is just a bunch of footage of me when I was a kid. Yeah, and... I saw some of that. I was curious. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I, I forgot that I even started with drums till I started finding all this old footage for the song. So that was cool. But uh, yeah, I started with drums, and then the acoustic came after that. Okay, and then the cover band was the next step? Yeah, the cover band, that was mostly me singing, and then I randomly played... Uh, guitar i i stopped playing drums I, I played drums for maybe like three or four years and then i found that writing with a guitar was much more easier on the ears than writing with the drums <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah, oh, so you just fun. did you ever go back to drums like do you play drums anymore i i produce or play them so i play them okay. well enough that it can get in the song but i would probably not do it live yeah <laughs> Okay. I'm, I'm close i'm close not even close to like keith like our drummer but you know i i like to play all the instruments that's why i like that's why i'm glad i'm kind of morphed into a producer and not so much just a musician now mm -hmm. where i'm able to I'm able to do that for my songs and for other people's songs too mm -hmm. very cool so so you um you started playing with the, what happened from the cover band did you have a, a band of like original music prior to going to college uh so the cover band was my whole high school uh years and then okay. when we graduated high school i wanted everyone to kind of not go to college and try to tour and we had like seven or eight original songs and i think it would have done decent honestly but all of them wanted to go to college so i was like <laughs> all right i guess i have to go to college too and that's when i started doing my solo stuff because when i went to philly i started making my own songs uh, and playing them for the first time ever solo. Oh, and so that was the first time you had ever played something you had written yourself in front of Just people? Just myself? Um, I think so, yeah. I used to play this place called Legendary Dobbs in Philly. Mm -hmm. That was in mic and a couple other places, but I don't think I ever played Just Myself before moving to Philly or college. Okay. So in college, that's when you started really kind of pursuing your solo career i mean as an artist correct uh, yeah but on accident now that i think about it because i went to school to be an audio engineer i think that's what my degree's in which oh, whatever okay. that's good for who the hell knows but <laughs> <laughs> uh and i in doing that we always had a lot of projects where you had to record yourself or record a friend uh -huh. to to get the song and then like we were graded on the recording process of the song so I ended up just making a lot of songs and recording myself or a lot of classmates needed me to do stuff because they couldn't play instruments. They were only there for engineering. 
Mm -hmm. you know? So I just, I was used a lot as that. And I really got to learn how, how the recording process works. And I've always loved recording like way more than live even because, because of that. I just, uh, I don't know. That was the first place that really made me be a solo musician without even noticing I was being a solo musician. Okay. And then from, from there, uh, you finished school. And then how do you get the attention of RCA? Uh, so <clears throat> after school, I moved to Hackensack, New Jersey, and I got a job at CBS radio as a broadcast engineer. I completely bullshitted my resume on that too. I said, <laughs> I, at, I said, I worked at so many like stations and like, <laughs> it was a really, really tech job, dude. Like you had to make sure the the signal from all, I think it was like nine radio stations went to the Empire State Building. And if they crash it, they'll like fix it. Oh my. I but worked most, in radio for 15 years. That's funny. I didn't do that end though. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, so that only ever happened like twice with really bad storms. But most of the job was just watching Netflix because nothing bad ever happened. Right. So it was a great <laughs> job. Anyway, <laughs> anyway so uh, there was a person who... I met at that station who didn't work there. And she said that she knew Joe Riccatelli, who is the EVP of RCA. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, I was making songs at the time, but didn't have any recognition at all for them. So I said, you know, maybe you should sing on one of these and we can show Joe Riccatelli. That way I have an in with RCA. Mm -hmm. And she just kept flaking every time we were supposed to go meet Joe. So I basically just guessed his email and it's, it's very, very simple. I don't want to give it out, but it's very simple. I don't know if it's still the same or not. Um, but I guessed it and literally put her name in the subject line. And I said, <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Jacob Kulik. I was supposed to meet with you today, but Ashley uh, said that she can't make it. Is there any way I, 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 can, I can meet with you? I'm already in New York. But I was in Hackensack, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so I emailed that. I went for a run. And then when I came back from the run, I looked at my phone and it was an email from him and he said uh i'm free within the next hour make sure you bring music so i had to quickly go to new york city in an hour and it was the day i'm not sure if i mixed this up this not but i think it was the day the pope was visiting so there was traffic oh, everywhere my. and all the roads were closed so i eventually got there double parked got the parking ticket but i met him and he liked some of the music and then for a year and a half i just played him demos and demos and demos and eventually uh, we had Ghost and we presented it and I got signed and all that, but it was just the, uh, it was a lot of, uh, I don't know what I would explain that as. It was a lot of chance and luck, but yeah, yeah, yeah. but I love that story. I love telling And that. ambition. That's crazy to just be like, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and guess. His well, email. yeah, I was trying yeah. a lot. I was trying a lot, but uh, I just couldn't believe that it actually all worked like that, so couldn't make so, a better story. <laughs> right. Totally. Totally. So, so once you get to meet him and you're, and you're sending him music, was he just kind of giving you feedback? Like what were you doing in the meet, like in the interim between getting signed and that first conversation? Yeah. So, um, I told him I always wanted to do radio. Like that's my thing that I, like I wanted to be a radio star. Like that was like the thing I always wanted to be since I was a kid. Uh -huh. And it's very like, I feel like it's something people don't really strive for anymore. Everyone's trying to do the viral things online. Like I still want to do yeah. the old, like blew up by radio. But anyway, that's um, what I. That's so funny because that's what I did for forever up, up until COVID. Actually, I got laid off of my terrestrial station because yeah, yeah there's no money there, of and there's still no money there. So unfortunate for people like us that like radio and and DJing yeah. and playing records. Like <laughs> there's just yeah, no money there. Bad. It'll come back. And I, I, I have faith in radio, but uh, I'm a very big radio fan. I love the compression. I love everything about radio. That's awesome. That's yeah. cool. But, uh, yeah. So he is a big radio guy. Mm -hmm. So he would basically give me feedback on like what the stations would like, what's in right now. Like just, you know, like, like hey, he'd be like, hey, I, I, I'm not like he would never claim that he knew what was in, you know, but he would mm -hmm. give me at least his opinion on what he's hearing and what's coming out, you know, in the future or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and it was also getting me better at songwriting because when I first started writing songs and he was listening to them versus when I eventually got signed, it's two different people. Like mm -hmm. it was way, way, like I was not taking it nearly as seriously enough as I started to once I got signed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and what is one of those? You said one of the songs you did present to him was Ghost, and that was kind of the moment that he was like, "All right, this 
let's do this well yeah because i mean the way it works is he still has higher ups too so he has to present it to his bosses everyone there's, there's like a massive chain of like approval <laughs> sure. stuff sure. happening you know um which i was so shocked at i could not i literally felt like i was just a part of this huge corp like all of a sudden it was like okay like look at this machine just tumbling with me in one of the gears that's kind of <laughs> cool but like i can't really do anything i just have to like let the machine happen but um, right yeah so he showed uh his boss ghost and uh you know we had to decide what a release strategy would be they had me writing with a lot of people i was writing with carl colosako who uh, he wrote shine down state of my head wow and i was writing with uh eric paquette and i was writing with dave katz who did a bunch of people's stuff he's a producer and a writer and i just kept writing they flew me they flew me down to nashville i got to write with jason wade and lifehouse like it was like literally writing all the time oh wow sick. yeah it was it was incredible oh, but that's um, amazing we had a chance to interview him uh Jason from Lifehouse, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's very very down to earth. I really yeah. like him. I hope we get to write again. I told him the next time we like go to Nashville, I'd hope that we can write. So cool. Yeah. Uh, what was I saying though? Where was I going with that? Uh, just that you had Ghost and and where you went, where that kind of took you. Oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we uh, he basically showed it to his boss. They got all the approvals and um, they they had a budget in the in the deal of you know how much they'll spend for a music video how much they'll spend for radio promo that's like what got me to agree to the deal and then mm -hmm. uh, we went there we pushed ghost to active rock radio which uh, in retrospect we you know maybe we think we should have went to alternative radio instead of active rock because active mm -hmm. rock is more of the uh they're just heavier you know they're not right. as alternative right. where ghost yeah. is more alternative record right but want to start me there because it takes more money to push an alternative than it does to active rock so it's kind of like all right you're like you're a tier one yet you know like there's different tiers <laughs> sure yeah uh but yeah ghost got me to to do a lot of cool stuff and then it got me to do the ep i went mm -hmm. did the hydroplane ep um which was, was that pretty exciting like did you, were those songs that you had uh had like written in those sessions like the nashville session stuff or Yes, that EP, that EP uh, Ghost was written with me and Carlo Colosaco and Eric Paquette. Mm -hmm. um, and then Carlo was like the main dude that I wrote with for most of that time period. He would write with me every time. I just felt like he was such a good writer. I wanted him on every session and I wanted him to help me every time I wanted to be in sessions too. So him and Carlo, me and Dave Katz, we did Hole in My Head and Colors. And then City and Hydroplane were me and Carl Colasaco, and we recorded those at Lake House Studios in uh, Asbury Park, New Jersey. The other ones were recorded at at the places we did like the demos, and then I just did final vocals, basically. That's so interesting to think about now that you now that you like kind of brought that up because the EP process was like me singing demos and then people polishing it, and then that that was my release. Interesting. Whereas like the new record, it was like you have the demos now you go to a studio and you finish it you like redo the vocals you finish mm -hmm. you you take more time on it you know it's more of a i don't know it's more of a hands-on experience instead of just like okay i sang this this one day and i don't even know if it's oh do interesting so you'd go in the studio for that first ep do your thing and then they would kind of take over from there you come back the next day yeah like i didn't have my hands on it i hated that that's one thing i hated and it had nothing to do with like rca or anything it was just like i let i i didn't speak up about that like hey i've been producing and writing my own songs since i was like 13 mm -hmm. i don't want to just let you make the songs you know mm -hmm. there were certain things like like colors i remember i hummed that like i made that in the shower like that was like a melody of mine but like it, nothing sonically was like my idea it was all the producers that were producing it mm -hmm. hydroplane was the closest one that was closest to me producing it but it still had producers yeah I, I i i'm sure it's you're in a situation where you have this major label that is interested in you and your your art and you're excited and like it, yeah, I can imagine it being hard to speak up to these people and these writers in these rooms and say, that, hey, I don't, you know, I don't like this. I want to do my own thing. That and the people that you're working with are like people in the industry that are doing it. Like you already know their product's good. It's like, right. okay, you produced this before, you've written this before, and it makes you go, if you don't have enough self-esteem, it just makes you think to yourself like, oh, well, 
they know what they're doing. I'm not sure if I know what I'm doing. This is just my first shot and I don't want to like screw this up. So I guess I'll just do whatever everyone tells you, tells me, you know? Right. Right. Like, I, th- I think, I think there's two different types of people. Like there's someone like me who does that. And there's another type that's like, ah, well, screw you. I'm going to do everything the way I want to, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like to find a nice little middle ground between I was going to say, there's kind of a <laughs> fine line there. I would think like, if you're telling them, you know, no, I'm, it's all what I wanted to do or you're not doing it, then they're probably going to say, okay, peace out. Yes. I've also experienced that too, though. That was also learning curves for me. Like I've had experiences where I've shown my demos to a producer or whatever. And then, you know, then be like, okay, I want to change all this. And then we go, no, I want it to be that, or I'll, like, like, I want it to be this. I just want you to like help a little bit. Uh-huh. You know, most of the time producers want to start from they want the freedom. And I understand that as a producer, like now that right. I produce other artists, it's like, I totally understand. I understand why the producer needs more uh, control, I guess, if that makes sense. But sure. you can always, always state your opinion on if you like it or not. That was the, like I said, I just didn't feel like I was, I wasn't even doing enough for my own project. Whereas like the new records, like, okay, I literally, uh, I either couldn't have done more or I could have done like 5% more. I always think you could, there's always a little bit more, you, can, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. F- from, from that first EP, did you, did the RCA put you on the road? I want to talk about your new record because I just want to get to it. Like, so, so yeah, you- I, I keep rambling, dude. I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. I love it. Uh, that's the point of this. <laughs> so yeah. So you, so you did, um, you, you did that EP and then did you get to go on the road? Like uh, what did RCA do for you guys? Uh, at that yeah. point um so i don't know if it was rca or pat uh but i think it was pat my manager pat magdarella he uh knew oh, the- you you're managed by pat magdarella yeah i did not know. that's 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 amazing because he used to manage uh green day and yeah uh rise against yeah he manages the google dolls yeah uh dream car is he still i mean that was kind of i, I don't know who he that. has I'm not sure what, what's going on now with him. I do know that he just started his own label. That's what I'm signed on now. So that's I, amazing, dude. I didn't know that. Very cool. Yeah. yeah he's I just great. know the name because we're in San Diego and he's in San Diego. Yeah. I think Encinitas. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Salon Beach, Encinitas area. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I, he knew the manager of Sleeping with Sirens. Okay. Who I think is Benji, which is the good Charlotte guy. I'm not sure that's all positive, but anyway, if that's all true, but anyway, um, so he said, Hey, I just started managing this group. Cool. you know, do you, would you let us on tour? So we went on tour with sleeping with sirens and the rocket summer, just me and Keith, uh, it was an acoustic tour. So it was just, it was the first time we ever, we have never been anywhere. It was just like Pennsylvania and like random vacations, to like South Carolina. Sure. So, first tour was like holy shit like we're like actually seeing the whole country you know get your first like i don't, I don't know we it was, cool. it, was, it was a sweet experience and rca uh gave us tour support for that so obviously that was great and we got to buy like the the live rig which with my backing uh my engineer experience like i we didn't hire anyone it was oh, just, awesome just me engineering all of our stuff mm-hmm. which is uh, a stress but <laughs> i can't yeah i can imagine um that was yeah. with that first acoustic tour that was the first acoustic tour and first time we ever toured first time i ever wow toured. and it was incredible to just start with like that because the first show i'll never forget we had merch and i've never toured so you have to understand i never played a live <laughs> show i don't understand what merch is i don't understand anything i don't understand backstage i don't get it <laughs> so sure. um literally the first show we had I thought we did all right. And then we went back to merch and there was a line of nothing but sleeping with sirens fans. I'm like, we aren't anybody, but to these people we are because we're opening for their like yeah. favorite, favorite band. band. And I was, and I their was just, fans oh. are crazy. They have such a huge like fan base. I was so amazed by that, man. It was such like a it's fucking, it sounds corny. It was like magical. It was like, holy shit. Like we've never ever played shows. And now we, like we just got 30 pan, like fans that we met in person you right know? and they bought a t-shirt and they wanted us to sign it and i'm like i why yeah so that was really <laughs> neat I, it was such a shock though like i i don't even think i even processed it yet like that going like that that was like a milestone for me of like 
okay, like I've never played at all. And then all of a sudden I played like most of the States and got a lot of fans from that. So that's so cool. That's yeah. amazing. And uh, you said yeah, you guys hadn't even played a show yet. Those were your first shows too. No, that was, our, that was, those were our first shows. And also like, um, like that was our first time performing but at that point i never even i never had a band together yet because cool is me like it's me right. and like the band you know like yeah I, I love my band they're all amazing like talented artists and musicians they all have their own projects and everything too but mm -hmm. um yeah that was the first time that we played acoustic and as soon as i got done that i was like okay so we need to buy a drum set and find some more band members <laughs> 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 yeah so we had to go we went to like an alta music got a white drum set keith started drumming instead of playing the cajon and you know we had to like form a real like a band real quick wow what a, yeah. so you kind of had to adapt to 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 the tour yeah like we things were happening for us before i don't want to say it like this but people things were happening to us before we were ready like, like mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't understand how to even play live shows with like, cause like, it's not the same live shows. My cover band was like amps and like, it's all organic, no metronome, anything. Like now right. it's like, here's, you got the metronome going, you have some, like some supporting instruments in the speakers, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to do any of that. So like, by the time we were off that tour, we got another tour with Andy Black and the fame. And that was our wow. first full band tour. Uh, so we did that tour, but I had to learn the live rig. I had mm -hmm. to learn how our in-ears worked. I had to learn how to do all those mixes. I'm trying to also like learn the songs from the EP. It was just insanity. But for that tour, just to make this finally circle, for that tour, we got tour support, but uh, we were sick of renting a van because they were so expensive. And I said, guys, if we don't get paid for this tour, we can buy a van. And that way, we'll always be able to do it. And we'll just stay in like really, really shitty hotels. <laughs> so yeah. that's what we did Andy Black Tour. Like they were all like cool with going on tour. Like, and we just, you know, bought a, bought a van and I still own it. And you guys just roughed it. <laughs> yeah, we roughed it. We roughed it. That was, and honestly, I, it, I wasn't prepared. It took me for a freaking whirlwind that tour. Like I could <laughs> I wasn't ready for like how different an acoustic tour is versus versus uh, the full Bring, band. Thing. Bringing like, all your gear. <laughs> bringing all your gear and also like just the sleep schedule is different with that. And and for some reason, the partying was different with the Andy Black tour. Like not with Andy Black specifically, you know, the fans, mm -hmm. it was just like our group of people, we all needed an escape exactly at that time in life. <laughs> sure. We were just a fucking mess okay. <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> it was like an amazing mess, but it was a mess. I was gonna I say, it was probably a good time, time like, though. <laughs> yeah, it was It was great. It was great. And I, I, it was definitely a learning experience. I know what I want to do and what I don't want to do when I tour. I know that routine is way more important than I than I thought I know that I want to definitely be more physically active mm -hmm. and just less with everything as well. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so once you guys get back from that tour and you start working on the new record that just came out yelling in a quiet neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, you said that that was different because you got to kind of produce and, and work on the record, like how you wanted it to be done. Correct. Well, that was different because everything i released before were singles they were like you know you make a song for the song and then that's it whereas right. this one was like all right there's a lot of stuff that happened in my life i'm gonna write an actual album now mm -hmm. and there was no outside opinion unless i asked for it okay. um and it was it was just a very in my head record too like i didn't really want to create it with anybody else i wanted to just make it all myself because it seemed like something very personal and i was not i didn't want to share that i didn't i didn't want to like like i i co i did write a couple songs with other people but um i just how would i explain it i i, I wrote songs with other people but we were writing it for for an album not necessarily like oh this one's gonna be a hit let's try to make a radio hit i didn't try mm -hmm. to make any hits for this record there's Got some that, that 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 have more radio playability but i wasn't just trying to make a hit Whereas like Colors, Ghost, Hole in My Head, City, and Hydroplanes were five attempts at hits. 
you know, <laughs> sure. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go into it like that. I wanted to write it for me and not write it for the reason of let's try to do this to become successful and popular. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in doing that, were you able to like go to the studio and demo out a lot of songs? And cause you, you were talking about earlier where you'd go in for the EP and just kind of sing your melodies and then the producers would kind of shape the song around that but like with this you were talking about doing it all kind of you right you had all the songs ready like t- tell me about the recording process for this one um yeah so i guess the the difference was like this i when i was doing the singles and the songs for hydroplane ep i mm-hmm. wasn't making any like demos in my laptop i was just going to the studio and that's where i worked and then i didn't work again whereas oh. this record was like all consuming it was like I'm now making all these songs on my laptop. I'm making the demos. I'm I'm producing this entire thing. And then what we did was we took all of my demos, which were probably like 85% done. Like I could have released them. They were, they mm-hmm. were good. But Pat wanted to, uh, he flew me out to, uh, what did he call it? Capital, to Capital Studios in LA. Mm-hmm. And I worked with Chris there, who, who was the only other producer on the record. It was me and him. Like, like he was the guy that was going to put the finishing touches on it. So we took my, my sessions and my stems, and then we added real drums at the studio, real guitars, uh, real, real electric guitars, like with amps, like not amp sims Mm -hmm. uh, simulators and um, basically whatever else we needed. Like some songs needed vocals redone. Other songs were the same, you know, Mm -hmm. but we basically just went there and put a bow on it. Right on. And when was, when did you, uh, fly out to, to capital and do that was that pre or post uh pandemic <laughs> yeah that was interesting about this record because it was all pre-pandemic it was okay. all like i was like in a world of just hurt for a little bit and <laughs> and the, the record is so much about like loss like i think that the pandemic doesn't like it doesn't affect it negatively or positively but all this was mm-hmm. definitely before we went to capital in december okay of 2019 so i basically got done the tour and then i wrote a, a, the whole time uh about my personal life and what was going on and then put it in the laptop december 2019 we go record it all and then mix and master it it was finished by like february we were okay. gonna release it in like march sure <laughs> and march hit and it just got kept getting pushed back and back and back, but it gave us time to make all the assets. You see, it made us. We got to do four lyric videos. Mm-hmm. You know, like it was, it was, it was a positive thing. And and for for me, it was as a writer. Uh huh. Yeah, because not in any other way, but as a writer, it was definitely mm-hmm. better. You had time to to find the old videos of yourself playing drums and and all that to to yeah, kind just of get just time period. You know, time to mm-hmm. to get creative and time to where i was at personally like i was kind of ready for the world to hit pause for a second it sucks that it was like a pandemic but i i needed a reset Mm -hmm. so i I mean i'm also i'm pretty pessimistic but i try to be optimistic so like i try to look at like okay like what is the good of what happened with this you know that Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what i see in sure yeah and with you know with all this in the in the new record have you been like doing live streams anything like that as far as promotion yeah so another engineering thing i had to figure out was to connect the rig to the live streams but we're able to do that so um well i'm in a two-bedroom apartment one of the bedrooms is just a studio so we kind of just hung up the uh the backdrop and then we have mic stands and the piano the acoustic it's only acoustic right now but uh-huh. we're gonna we're gonna try to do more legit maybe full band shows and we're also trying to do stuff with like the projectors so that it looks more like a live show for right now which has kind of been cool to be honest i thought it would be really really corny but <laughs> it's getting there we <laughs> yeah. haven't used it yet, but we will do you enjoy doing the live streams or is it just kind of it is what it is to get can get out and play a real show <laughs> uh i it does not even feel like getting out to be honest because basically keith just comes here and then um like me and April just play the, like we, we all play the live stream, but it's more like we just get to hang out for a night finally. So that's what I've enjoyed most about it. That's cool. It, it has been nice to, to hear the songs in the in-ears, like to actually be playing, but acoustic sets are not the same as live full band shows. So it's actually mm-hmm. like, it's like if the scale, it's like 
live stream acoustic, <laughs> then live stream, uh, th then then live acoustic, and then probably live stream full band, then full band. If that right. Yeah, so no, totally. It's the lowest of what we could possibly be doing right now, but <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. You're playing the songs. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and we're promoting the record, and people seem to be really liking the new songs and relating to it. So it's it's cool to be able to do them on live streams and have people comment like what their favorite is and you know. Yeah. Being able to yeah, be able to communicate directly back and forth with your with your fans and everything. Yes, it's kind of like a virtual like we we're meeting you at the merch table. <laughs> <laughs> a virtual merch table meetup. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a virtual merch table where we're sitting with a cajon and an acoustic playing for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's hilarious thank you so much jacob for doing this i really appreciate it man You've yeah been thank you for having me I appreciate yeah it. i do have one more question i want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists uh my advice is always to start because i feel like everyone always says uh that they don't have a big enough fan base or they're too shy to do it whatever it is i i just really urge you with anything in life is if you want to do it, just start doing it. Don't care who's watching you, just do it for you. And if it feels good, you do it more and more. And eventually people will start to pay attention, but definitely do it for you. Bring it back, bro.